All right, so I have 6.05, so um, we're going to get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Denise Tecuna from NV5, and this is the Amphibian Crossing Waterloo Road Project Public Information Center for the PE phase. The project is sponsored by the State of New Jersey Department of Treasury Division of Property Management and Construction, known as DPMC, and it's in coordination with New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, NJDEP, and New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife Endangered and Non-Game non Species Program. Um, we're gonna have a, we'll be running from 6 to 8 p.m. tonight. We'll have this first presentation, and then we'll have another presentation about 7.05 if we have um, new guests joining us. Mike, you wanna go to the next slide? So we'll do introductions for our panelists. Like we said, my name is Denise Acuna from NB5. Um, Mackenzie, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, sure. My name is Mackenzie Hall. I'm a biologist with New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife's Endangered and Non-Game Species Program. And Fred? Uh, hi, my name is Fred Scherer I'm with NB5, and I'm a design engineer. And Mike? Uh, my name is Mike Kyler, um, engineer with the Highways Department with NV5. Okay, great. And um, who is NV5? So NV5, we're a multidiscipline engineering firm and an environmental services firm. We're located in Parsippany, New Jersey. We have offices throughout the U.S. and in the New York metropolitan area. Um, design services on this project are going to be conducted all by our New Jersey staff and include roadway and engineering design um, and environmental services by our specialists in ecology, threatened and endangered species, cultural resources, and permitting. Um, we're going to do a brief presentation at this time and then another one at 7.05, followed by questions and answers. Um, you can use the chat box to ask questions. Post-meeting comments and questions can be received um, through, actually, that's wrong, not May 6th. We're going to go two weeks out, so that's got to be updated. Um, those comments can be submitted to Mackenzie Hall. Her information is there. You can either mail it or we prefer email. So if you think of anything else after our meeting, you can send um, any questions or comments to Mackenzie at her email there, mackenzie.hall at bep.newjersey.gov. point I'm going to turn it over to Mackenzie to just talk a little bit about the background of the project and how we got here. Okay thanks Denise hope everyone can hear me fine and I'm going to try not to look at my own image because my lips aren't moving at the same speed as my uh, <laughs> my mouth <laughs> um, but at any rate it's nice to to see some folks here tonight and some familiar names uh, as well I know a few of you are probably already pretty familiar with this project through the years uh, so it's nice to see you again. Um, I wanted to start out by saying that this is National Amphibian Week, and we totally didn't plan it that way, but it's a pretty neat way to be celebrating Amphibian Week. And before I got right into the, the Waterloo Project, I just wanted to give a really quick broad view of amphibians because they are secretive little animals that live in damp places and uh, they tend to go unnoticed and a bit underappreciated uh, sometimes. So in New Jersey, we have about 34 different species of salamanders, frogs, and toads. Uh, this is just a little sampling of them. You may already be real familiar with some of these guys, like the American toad, who you may see hanging around your yard or garden, um, or the spring peeper in the upper right corner there, uh, which are the tiny little tree frogs making those impossibly loud peeping choruses from the water this time of year. Um, in the middle of the screen there is a spotted salamander. Uh, they're kind of the poster child for our Waterloo Road project, uh, though most people have never seen these stocky seven inch long salamanders because during the day they're mostly underground in rodent burrows in the forest or rock fissures, um, things like that. And they really only make a big showing on land once a year, which is during their spring migration. Uh, but I'll get back to that in just a second. So in terms of their ecosystem role, uh, if you were to take all of the amphibians in an acre of forest and all of the birds in that same acre of forest, the amphibians would weigh 
more than twice as much as the birds, and that's called biomass. Um, in fact, the redback salamanders, which are there in the lower right corner, they're one of the single most common animals out in the woods, with something like 3,000 of them per acre. So amphibians are a really big part of the food chain in the forest uh, and in, in the forest maintenance cycle. Um, they are mostly carnivorous. They eat insects, worms, slugs, spiders, uh, and in turn, a whole lot of bigger animals eat them. Uh, anything from turtles and snakes to herons, owls, songbirds, shrews, foxes, kind of you name it. Um, amphibians actually help to keep a healthy leaf litter in the forest, which holds carbon in the soil. Uh, kind of important these days talking about climate change. And of course, their moist absorbent skin makes them very sensitive to, to pollutants. And that means that amphibians are good bioindicators of environmental quality. Next slide. Fernal pools. Um, fernal pools are an essential piece of the Waterloo Road story because amphibians like the spotted salamander, Jefferson salamander, and wood frog uh, rely on these temporary ponds for breeding. Vernal pools are special because they're full of water by springtime. Uh, so, you know, for example, the, the photo there was taken right about uh, this time of year, but then they're usually dried out by late summer. So fish can't live there and that makes them great nurseries for amphibians. But at the same time, the amphibian eggs and larvae, uh, these are spotted salamander eggs here, um, they're basically in a race to grow up, lose their gills and leave the pool before the water is gone. And that urgency is why most vernal pool breeding amphibians make what we call these explosive migrations down to the water in early spring, really as soon as the ground thaws and they get a warm rainy night to move in. Next slide. And you may not know, although I think several of you on the, on the webinar do already know that there is a really significant vernal pool right here uh, circled there inside Waterloo Village uh, with a whole diverse community of life that revolves around it. Um, literally thousands of salamanders and frogs migrate to this breeding pool every spring from the surrounding forest and have done that for centuries. Um, but the modern twist, of course, is that now there's this fairly busy road they have to cross in order to reach the water and have to cross it again to get back to the forest. Um, and amphibians don't fare terribly well against traffic. Um, from past studies, we know that just 15 vehicles per hour can kill more than half of all amphibians that try to cross a road. And Waterloo can have more than 100 vehicles per hour during migration events. So there's been a real concern that the population here could be wiped out over time if nothing is done. On the positive side, though, this stretch of Waterloo Road is bordered on both sides by state preserved land, um, Alamuchi State Forest to the north and Waterloo Village to the south. And so that's um, one thing that makes it a great candidate for a wildlife passage project. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, and again, like I mentioned, there's just an extraordinary amphibian population here to protect. Um, the Conserve Wildlife Foundation has been our partner. Um, they've been leading migration surveys at this location since 2012. And at times we've seen more than 300 frogs and salamanders per hour crossing this quarter mile stretch of road. Uh, close to 20,000 amphibian encounters have been recorded in total right here. Um, and just for context, we've mapped dozens of sites like this across North Jersey, but the Waterloo Road crossing is the most significant one that we know of. And combined with the amount of traffic there, this is our number one priority site for conservation. Um, we have considered different options for how to protect these amphibians long term. Um, obviously, having people out on the road on rainy nights, helping them across is not sustainable and it's uh, honestly not ideal in terms of safety. Um, Road detours do work great in some places, uh, like you may have heard about the road in East Brunswick, New Jersey, that gets closed down on rainy spring nights every year. But Waterloo is an important connector road and a detour would be long and difficult to coordinate across jurisdictions and 
most likely pretty unpopular um, from a driver's perspective. So we chose to pursue a wildlife tunnel system here instead that'll let amphibians and other animals too um, to cross safely back and forth below the road whenever they need to. Next slide. Okay, and those were just a few other photos of uh, migration events and some of the different species that we're seeing out there on the road. And you can go to the next slide. And a few more pictures of what migration night looks like with traffic coming through and the volunteers who uh, over the past 10 years have been out there during the spring migration events to record the animals seen and to help them across. And next. All right, and I put this slide in uh, for some extra context because we all know that New Jersey is one of the most developed and road dense states in the whole country. And that's uh, convenient for us busy people, but it's making it harder and harder for animals to get where they need to go. Um, so for more on how New Jersey is addressing habitat connectivity and roads on a statewide scale, because we're not just looking at this little amphibian um, crossing at Waterloo Road example, we're, we're really trying to think of this across the landscape. Uh, you can check out our Connecting Habitat Across New Jersey project, uh, Change for short, and the website there is change.nj.gov. And next. And then lastly from me on the backstory, I just wanted to point out that um, our amphibian tunnel project construction is going to be funded by a grant called the Transportation Alternatives Program, or TAP. And TAP is a Federal Highway Administration program that the New Jersey Department of Transportation manages for our state. And the whole point of this program is about funding non-traditional transportation type projects like pedestrian lanes, rails to trails, street beautification, historic preservation. And there's also this category about reducing wildlife uh, vehicle caused mortality or restoring habitat connectivity. So it's a perfect fit for this Waterloo Road project. So uh, in 2016, the Division of Fish and Wildlife applied for a TAP grant and we were awarded $503,000 to construct it. Uh, I believe that this will be the first wildlife project funded by TAP in New Jersey. Uh, so that's pretty neat and we're hoping that all goes well and we'll be able to use it a lot more in the future. Um, and I also just wanted to point out that we've had support and input from a lot of people in order even to get to the, the point of applying for that TAP grant. So I just wanted to list some of these key folks here. Um, and in particular, I'll just say that since the road itself belongs to Sussex County, their engineers have been so helpful making sure that we're designing a project that can actually be built on their roadway. Um, Byram Township has been wonderfully supportive in a lot of ways. Uh, the Conserve Wildlife Foundation, uh, whom I mentioned, has supplied all the amphibian data, which is really why this project even exists. Um, I'll say that uh, amphibian tunnels aren't that common in the United States yet, but they have been done in different parts of the world, particularly Europe. And Tom Langton is an expert on building these tunnels. He's done them in different parts of the world, and he helped a lot with our conceptual design early on. Uh, and then I just wanted to give a shout out to the, the neighborhood in general. Um, this has really held up the Sussex County motto of people and nature together. Um, and I feel like this whole process has been a, a pretty nice example of that so far. So, so thanks to the, the neighborhood as it were. And of course, the list of people involved in this project just keeps on growing. Uh, and I think that's a good segue to turn it back over to Denise from NV5 to talk about the design that they're working on. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mackenzie. So this is just showing in some of Mackenzie's slides, um, Waterloo Village, it's actually on the south side and Almuchi State Parkland. Um, Waterloo Road is the Sussex County Roadway under their jurisdiction. And this is within the project area of this photo. Go to the next one, which will show the vernal pool. This is a vernal picture of the vernal pool that Mackenzie talked about. So this is where they're destined to cross um, 
Waterloo Road, which is basically bisecting the habitat. So the project purpose um, is to construct an amphibian passage system along this 1,200 foot section of Waterloo Road and sur surrounding areas within Alamuchi State Park and Waterloo Village. It's all located in, within Byron Township, Sussex County. Um, as Mackenzie said, this project offers a long-term long solution to the vehicle cost mortality, threatening significant local population of amphibians in this area. So Waterloo Road is bisecting it. We're trying to create a safe passage between the habitat um, and the vernal pool and where they're going back and forth. So the area where the tunnel system is going to be located is just to the um, to the east of the Waterloo Village entrance. So Alamuchi State Park is on the north side of the roadway and Waterloo Village on the south side. You can go to the next. And Mike Kylar is helping us. Uh, some of us have limited Wi-Fi where we're living. So um, as we're remote, Mike Kylar, Mike Kylar who's a significant uh, project engineer on this project is also helping us run the PowerPoint. So we appreciate that. Um, so our proposed improvements are going to include four tunnels. They're going to be underneath Waterloo Road and then the installation of guide fencing on both sides of the roadway to funnel the amphibians towards the tunnel. Tunnel. Go to the next. Um, this is an existing example of a an Esapeak um, turtle tunnel. So it's different species, but just to give you an idea, um, at this location, it's a graded top. Um, we're not going to have a graded top. Sussex County didn't want that, um, to have a graded top or a trench system. And we'll get into that. We don't want to collect water um, at this location. Uh, and this is just showing a little bit about uh, something similar um, that's, in this case, for turtle, turtles. And we'll have a different type of fencing as well. Go to the next. So we're in a highly sensitive um, environmental area, obviously with Alamuchi State Park and Waterloo Village. So since we're using federal funds, we have to do what's called an environmental document that's called a categorical exclusion document. And what this does is it addresses any potential environmental issues that may um, come about, anything from deforestation, if we're clearing trees, cultural resources, ecology threatened and endangered species, wetlands, air and noise, hazardous public reaction, such as this public outreach that we're doing now, uh, socioeconomic and environmental permits. So any CED document has to look at all of these elements. Um, NB5 is preparing that, and then we'll submit it to NJDOT. NJDOT facilitates reviews of all CEDs in the state of New Jersey. Um, our project, is within the New Jersey Highlands Preservation Area. So we're subject to regulations of the Highlands Water Protection and Planning Act rules. We'll be having a New Jersey Highlands General Permit known as GP1. Um, we're also within New Jersey Historic State Preservation Office Project Review. We'll have coordination and approvals and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're within the Upper Delaware Soil Conservation District and we will re be required to have a Sussex County road opening permit. As Mackenzie says, um, we're partnering with Sussex County on this project. It is under their jurisdiction. Go to the next point. For cultural resources, so the project area falls partially within, within the Waterloo Village Historic District. The Waterloo Village Historic District is on both the New Jersey and the National um, registers of historic places and they they got on the register they got on the register in 1977. The Leach Golandi house is located just west of the project area and that'll be subject to an intensive level historic architectural survey which will provide recommendations as to its potential eligibility for the national register. Um, an assessment of project effects is required by section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and that it will be provided for the Waterloo Village Historic District. Um, this information is going to be compiled. It's being done by NB5's Culture Resource Unit, and we prepare an application for project authorization, and that's required as part of the New Jersey Register of Historic Places Act. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office will then 
review that and they'll be they'll determine if there's any mitigation measures that are required um, associated with this project. You can go to next. So this is basically showing there are four tunnel locations and the uh, approximate fence limits. The locations were located to best connect the habitat bisected by the roadway. Um, there are existing water waterways, there's um, wetland impacts, so we position the tunnels to avoid or minimize those impacts. Um, the ends or the, the culvert ends or tunnel ends are located outside the clear zone. The clear zone is an area, if an errant vehicle goes off the road, you want them to be able to maneuver their way or be with on a grade where they can get back on the road. We don't want to create a ditch or a dangerous um, situation. So the ends of the culverts are going to be outside of what's known as a clear zone. You can go to the next slide. This picture will show what a typical culvert will look at, will look like. They're about 58 feet long, um, two feet high and three feet wide with a six inch base, so base on the bottom of the culvert. Um, these tunnels will be underneath the existing pavement box. Unlike the, the turtle culvert that you saw was up a little bit higher, um, it was more like a trench drain. Um, what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna redirect any drainage to these tunnels and make them function as a water culvert. Um, we don't wanna revise any of the existing drainage patterns in the area. So it's important that we're gonna be grading around it so that they don't collect water. Um, we don't wanna do that because of the drainage patterns. And we also don't wanna do that for the habitats at this location. The design standards um, that we are using are also in, in coordination with um, change, which Mackenzie talked a little bit about. That's connecting habitats across New Jersey. They have a great website with a lot of information including um, design standards on, on issues such as something like this, where we have um, you know, preferred grades, a 2% grade, uh, approximate size of the opening. So a lot of that information was collected based upon, um, as Mackenzie said, there aren't too many um, here, but there's a lot in Europe. And then just as they're coming about in the US, um, just a lot of sharing of information. go to the next swing. So this is a sample of uh, potential wildlife fencing at this location and it's based upon the species at our site, a lot, a lot what um, Mackenzie talked about. Uh, the fences as you can see on the right they're going to be angled so that the amphibians don't come up to something straight and have to go perpendicular. Um, it's really just to funnel them to a safe passage. There's the arch top for some of the amphibians that we have as for, that might be hopping, such as frogs and toads. And um, the fence layout has been designed to avoid or minimize um, large tree impacts, rocks, waterways, and wetlands. And um, we were out in the field recently to go out and kind of refine that. We also, we want to capture the habitat and not impact um, habitat. Mike, you can go to the next one. So what are our next steps? Um, from this public information center, um, any comments that you have tonight, we'll address questions. Um, we're, gonna, we're in what's called the design development or preliminary design phase. We have to follow up by environmental permitting, and then we advance the project to final design. As far as the anticipated project schedule, um, we're looking to complete the design development phase this summer. Um, we have to then advance it to final design phase, and we're looking at that completion um, probably about the fall of this year and anticipated construction to start next spring. Um, we would have loved to have the project in by the time of the next migration season. Um, unfortunately, just due to review times necessary for the permits and then timing restrictions, um, with the county roadway and construction in the winter, there, there's a number of issues. Um, and then we don't want to be doing the construction during the height of the migration season and be impacting them. So we're looking at, at a start um, in the roadway probably after um, about this time or, or, or later May um, next year. Go to the next one, Mike. 
So we, we're going to open up the chat box, um, and then after that, you can take. Um, we had a typo on the on the first slide. We'll correct that for the next presentation. Um, we'll take any other comments and questions um, up till May 18th. And the reason for that is we want to be able to wrap up um, a summary of comments and responses for our CED document. So we either have to give a time frame, so we're giving it two weeks. We will have another public information center similar to this in the next design phase. Um, Mackenzie's information is there. Um, you could send her an email or, um, or old-fashioned snail mail if you have any other comments. Also, what we'll be doing is we'll post um, this video and a meeting summary on NJDEP's website at the address shown below. And what we'll show is, what we'll put on there is um, frequently asked questions. So if we get a lot of people asking the same questions or or, or we want to just um, expand or clarify anything, we'll include that information on that site shown. So we'll open it up to um, questions and answers. And you can use the chat box. Yeah, it looks like we have one already. Okay, I didn't uh, see it. Mike, if you could read it. Um, how are the crossings facilitated before the tunnels are installed? How are the crossings, um, I think they're saying, how do we determine the locations of the crossings? Does that seem to be the, the question? Um, Mike, if you go back. I think maybe uh, Bill is asking how how we're helping the animals across the road. I'm not sure if, if that's oh, specific okay. enough, how we're right. helping the animals across the road before the tunnels okay. are are actually there. Uh, if that's the question, I can I can tackle that. What, yeah, how are they being helped now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. so there's a, a group, like I mentioned, the Conserve Wildlife Foundation. I think I even saw Christine Healy is on the webinar here. Uh, Christine is most recently the one to be coordinating a volunteer effort. Uh, if you're local to the area and have ever uh, driven down Waterloo Road on a rainy evening in the spring, you may have seen some folks out with flashlights and reflective vests and clipboards. Um, there have been teams of volunteers to go out on those rainy spring migration nights and basically set up patrol along the road to watch for animals, you know, pick the amphibians off the road, carry them to the other side in whichever direction they're headed. Um, that's been not just a, a rescue effort for um, all these years since, since 2012 when the site first came onto our radar, uh, but it's also been the way that we've collected data to show what species there are um, using the site and what numbers in what density, in which segment. So it helped us decide where the tunnels should be placed. Um, and, you know, to some degree, the level of roadkill that happens uh, even while we're there. So I'll just say that interestingly, there have been some studies on the impacts that roadkill has on amphibian populations. And uh, one researcher estimated that a roadkill rate of just 10% for salamanders can lead to local extirpation over time, which means that the population would disappear over time. And uh, so that 10% figure really is alarming to me because even while the teams of rescuers are there on the road, our mortality rate is usually at least 10%. So, um, you know, without any solution here, we would easily see this population nosedive. Um, so that's, you know, just one way that data has been really instrumental in helping us to, to justify doing this project. And I hope that answered your question. Yeah, and if Mike, if you go to slide 19, so the locations of the, for a more permanent solution, um, as Mackenzie said, they're doing the rescues um, for those few rainy, rainy nights when there's most um, concentration of amphibians migrating in this area. And throughout the years have, where they've been monitoring, that's also helped out with the um, location and the limits of where the tunnels are going to be located. Uh, I see one question that came in that said, 
how will it impact traffic during construction. Um, we can't detour the roadway, so there'll be temporary lane closures. If we could detour the roadway, we would be, if it was an easy detour, we would be uh, detouring the roadway or asking Sussex County to do that, you know, during these heavy migration nights. Um, so traffic, it's, traffic will be um, done by uh, not a full detour, one lane per direction with flagging as it's needed for the safety of road users and the construction personnel. Uh, looks like two more questions came in. Okay. Uh, is the migration completed for this year? It, it is basically, yeah. Yeah, the, the peak migration for the vernal pool, you know, those explosive breeders that sort of all go at once on migration nights, that, that wrapped up um, during the month of March really usually happens sometime between late February and early April, just depending on the weather. Um, however, you know, one of the benefits to having the tunnels in the ground, uh, hopefully by next year, um, is that they're, you know, those those vernal pool breeding specialists are not the only animals, are not even the only amphibians that are crossing that roadway as the season goes on. You know, for example, in, in March, we see the big push of Jefferson salamanders, spotted salamanders, wood frogs. Then as the season goes on, there might be more spring peepers and then the weather hits a certain temperature and the toads get in the mix. And then, you know, as the summer goes on, now we've got um, the northern gray tree frogs, which uh, it's kind of a humid, warm, warm afternoon. You may even be hearing them trilling in your backyard right now. So, you know, we get a lot of them then moving to uh, to the breeding pool. And so, you know, while we say there's one very protracted spring migration event, that's that's just what we go out there to to physically help with because the abundance of animals moving across the road during that time really warrants it. But there is movement over a much broader season. And then of course, once the, the I hope I'm not getting long winded here, but once the, um, once the young amphibians metamorphose and move on to land, then they slowly make their way back to the forest and will eventually encounter the road. So there's really a lot of, a lot of movement that happens and the Conserve Wildlife Foundation has also done daily roadkill surveys during the summer months just to quantify how much we miss <laughs> just by focusing on those early spring breeding events. And there are a whole suite of species that are moving back and forth across this road and not even just amphibians, but also snakes and turtles and small mammals too. So we expect that this tunnel system will help, you know, a lot of animals more than just our target species. I see a question that came in. Um, how long does the effort last and how are the dates determined? So I'm not sure if they're saying the effort um, for design um, or the construction. So I, I'll answer um, both of them. So as far as the dates determined for construction, um, we have review time that's required. Um, it'll, we have coordination with our permits. So we have DEP permits. Um, we're dealing with New Jersey Highland, the State Historic Preservation Office, in addition to Sussex County. Um, and then how were those dates determined? We have different review times um, that will be required. And then as I said earlier, the start of construction is determined. We could have, we would have been done with the design earlier but we have timing restrictions on the roadway due to weather. Um, and then it also we wanted to um, not be having construction done during the height of the migration season. And um, as long as the effort will last. Um, these are culverts similar to what would be used for water. Um, there will be routine maintenance. Uh, same thing with the fencing. If there's a tree that falls down and damages part of the fence, the fence would have to be repaired. So I think that was the, what they were getting at as far as, um, as possibly future maintenance. And I think there was a similar question that says, what is this project duration in terms of completion? Um, similarly, 
we would hope we're hoping to be done with the completion um, next summer. Like we said, we're starting a little bit later just so that um, we get past that initial migration system, um, season. Uh, a contractor will come on board. Uh, there's something called shop drawings where they have to send, um, you know, show us the the culverts, and we do that as far as in the road work. Um, probably def probably less than a month. Um, it's all going to be depending upon our coordination with the county and what they'll let us do um, kind of each day. Uh, if we're closing everything up or if we could use some other measures. Um, so we are going to be doing a more detailed construction schedule and we'll have that all done for the final design phase. Is there enough time to install tunnels before the next spring migration? Unfortunately, there isn't. Um, as we said, this is a highly sensitive environmental area. So we have a number of um, permits that we have to do. Um, so just the timing, unfortunately, um, we can't do that. I don't know if I'm seeing them in the same order. Let's see. So what time of year is the best for construction? Like we said, the best time for construction is after that my the um, concentrated migration, and then we want to have it done before you know they start going back um, across the roadway. So we're timing it so that is the best time for construction, both for the amphibians and then just um, weather. Yeah, I'll just add to that too that there there will be for the fence line especially, um, but also for the the tunnel, you know, where the tunnels daylight themselves, there will be some uh, vegetation removal that will be needed, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly particularly shrubs, but also uh, a small number of mature trees too. And we are um, actively going to be avoiding the active season for nesting birds and roosting bats and, and all of that to have the vegetation that needs to be removed already cleared before spring arrives to avoid any other conflicts with wildlife. Yeah, and I, I see um, a comment and someone saying that could they do verbal comments. This is just the format that we've been doing with public meetings. Unfortunately, sometimes people are um, saying inappropriate things so we've just done that, um, kind of done that format. And if you have a series of questions, you can yeah, email them to Mackenzie um, or myself if you have my email. And we're getting some comments that people are support the project and that it's finally happening. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think I went through all the ones that I saw. Mike, if I missed something, we have a greetings from Stanhope Township. Greetings from Stanhope. Howdy. <laughs> I think we got all the questions. Okay, and we'll be hanging out here for uh, at least another hour too, so feel free to take your time and submit any others that you may think of. Yeah, and then what we'll do is, um, we said we, we announced that we would have um, another presentation at 7.05. Um, if we don't have anyone else join us, um, we won't do that and we'll keep it open for more questions and answers. So if you're debating whether you're going to hang around or not, or if you, Mike, if you could tell if people joined late or not. Look like uh, looks pretty like, good. Looks like we have nine people on right now. Um, okay. That's, like that's what I know. Okay. Yep, so I'll give a few minutes. If there's any other questions. Uh, 
Um, someone said, thank you. Another person says, I have another meeting to call into. Thanks for what you are doing on this. Bye. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Scott. Bye-bye. Yeah, we're, we're not insulted if you have to leave. Um, new question came in. Are there any other wildlife projects in the Byram area that are going on or in development? So not just in Byram, I know um, NV5 is working on a number of different projects for DOT. Um, and what we look at if we're doing a new um, new bridge is a critter crossing for say Bobcat. Um, it's almost like a ledge. So throughout New Jersey, there's a, there's a number of um, other wildlife crossings. Whenever we're doing a new culvert or a bridge project, we do look at that. I don't know specifically in um, Byram Township. I'm not sure if you do, Mackenzie. Yeah, I can't think of any off the top of my head, although uh, in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm sort of seeing that even once these tunnels are in the ground, you know, unfortunately, I mean, Waterloo Road is a very long road. It parallels the river for a lot of its length. Uh, there are a lot of marshy, eddy type areas and even some other vernal pools along that road. So unfortunately, this this project alone doesn't solve the issue all along the road. So there may be some opportunities to, you know, once this premier location is safeguarded to then move along and start monitoring another spot, um, which might be important as well. Uh, because yeah, there are, I mean, if you uh, were to visit our, our change mapping, the change.nj.gov, pull up an interactive mapping and you can, you know, you can uh, select a layer that will show you where all of the vernal pool locations are in New Jersey, all the known ones anyway. And wherever they're close to roadways, there could be issues like this too. So uh, even if not right in Byram Township, we do have a laundry list of other locations that would probably be next in line uh, for something like this as long as everything goes smoothly and you know we will be doing some post installation monitoring for at least a couple of years after these tunnels and guide fence go in to make sure that you know the animals are receiving them well um, everything that we're seeing in the literature points to that it should be perfectly successful and, and well received by the animals but we will be monitoring that just to make sure um, so again kind of a long-winded answer but yeah there are, there are always other sites in the queue and i guess one thing i didn't mention um and it'll be be done um not the construction funding for this project but separate will be um cameras so similar to um, the sample that we showed with Aspen Peak Turtle Tunnels, um, where the project is planning to include um, wildlife cameras. Yeah, if anybody wants to check out a neat example, if you're still listening, there's a project that is fairly fairly similar to this. Some of their specs are a bit different. They're their site is a bit different than this, but uh, up in Moncton, Vermont, if you look up Moncton, uh, Moncton Road Amphibian Tunnels, they I think even have their own Facebook page or it's part of a different Facebook page, but they've got some photos and videos that give you a tour of what that project looks like now that it's in. And they did a really neat thing where they installed a time-lapse camera inside one of the tunnels during the first year. And the photo quality is fairly cruddy and, um, you know, nonetheless, like you can see these little amphibian bodies moving through it and, you know, people just love it and it just, you know, it just shows that it, it works and um, it's just a really cool example of the concept in action. So if anybody wants to check that out, it's kind of a neat, neat thing too.
And just since we've got a little quiet air here, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, I'll go back, to, uh, go back to our change mapping. At, again, the change.nj.gov, pull up that interactive mapping. And one of the big purposes of that change effort is to, to highlight areas across New Jersey which are most important for wildlife connectivity across the landscape. And so if you pull up that, that map, it'll basically show you in, in greens and tans and browns um, the important habitat cores and corridors for animals to be moving through across the land. It also identifies uh, road conflicts in the way. So within the within the change mapped priority areas, it'll identify road segments where maybe um, there, there might be a priority for trying to do something like this for wildlife passage, whether it's underpasses, overpasses, which would be much more expensive, of course, um, or or projects like what Denise was describing, where you know maybe there's a stream going under a road where there's just a small culvert that doesn't allow land animals to pass through it easily where you could simply you know expand that that culvert underpass to allow dry passage for you know turtles or bobcats or you know other wildlife who are moving through the land to to be able to encounter that and and to actually walk beneath, beneath the road on dry land rather than being forced to go up and across the road surface um, so there's some My, neat things built into that change mapping that you can check out there. Yes, the uh, uh, sorry, can, uh, Bill, it's C H A N. Yeah, Mike, can you pull up? Um, yes, Mike, can you pull up slide number nine? And I think that's what Mackenzie was going to say. The acronym for connecting habitats across New Jersey. I think it's on slide nine. The uh, one before that. So maybe it's slide eight. There you go. There so, you go. Yeah. So it's C H A. So somebody asked. Connecting habitat across New Jersey is the acronym there, Bill. And there goes the scary map of Red Death. <laughs> yeah, I, I know of one project that um, we're involved with is, is on Route 15 in, um, over the Pollens Kill in Lafayette. And that one will have a um, crude crossing. There's a bobcat that'll have a ledge that's a uh, proposed bridge replacement that's being designed by DOT. That's one in um, not too far area. Can you pull up um, maybe just the change website? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're having difficulty, yeah, we're it's running good, so I don't want to mess you up. Yeah, that's all right. We're subject. There we go. So we're subject to our uh, our Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi and three uh, three computer screens at once. <laughs> yeah, might be like an air traffic controller. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. Yeah, so similar to uh, Google Maps or any of the 
online mapping queries up in the upper left. You could even just type in an address or a location and it'll zoom you right into the map. And you can see how you fit into the connectivity puzzle, as we say. And Waterloo Road is highlighted on this map as a wildlife core area with a severe road barrier. <laughs> so there's an extra justification there too. So what we'll do is we don't get any questions. Uh, we'll wait to 7:05. If uh, nobody new logs on, um, we may just wait and kind of stop recording until somebody logs on. If somebody new logs on, we'll repeat our presentation. I'll just say hi to Lisa, Lisa Varna. Also, yeah, I'm yeah. not sure. I I don't see who the questions are coming from, but then I figured out who some were coming from. I just figured out some. Um, mine will say that they're coming from Mike. So I don't know, Mike, if you're pushing them through. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So you're pushing them through. Okay. If some I figured out kind of after the fact. Great. Yeah, just some of the different logistics. Thank you, Lisa. So I'm not sure if either um, Christine or Lisa missed the beginning of the presentation. Um, through the chat box, you can maybe just let us know if you did. I'm, I wasn't sure if you were logged on when we started. Because since we did in our notices say that there would be a second um, presentation at 7.05, we'll wait until then. Uh, if you saw the presentation, if everyone who's on now saw the presentation from the beginning, um, we will hold off until somebody uh, new comes on. But just let us know in case you did miss the beginning. We could go back and review it. And it'll be on the website. Uh, Christine Healy, I missed the beginning, but I think it was just crossing stuff, so I'm good. Thanks for the presentation. <laughs> Thanks, for Christine. This. Yeah, the, the beginning is basically um, what are amphibians and why are they important, so I think we'll that down for sure. You, know, you can go to the uh, first slide, though, Mike. Um, go to the first few slides. Yeah, let it run. And I, yeah, oh, I love that one. Um, yeah, so actually on this slide, Mike, we'll change that to the uh, 18th, May 18th. 
we had tried to do this a little bit earlier um a few weeks ago and then we um we just had to bump up the meeting date due to some logistics oh there you go There you go. Hi. Hi, everyone. So we had paused um, the recording while we didn't have any additional stakeholders um, log on. So there was one presentation this evening followed by questions and answers. Um, you can continue to submit questions and answers um, to Mackenzie Hall. Her information is on the slide shown. And we're going to take comments through Tuesday, May 18th. And we appreciate you watching this video and any feedback that you can offer. Thanks very much. Thank you.